Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Today we have John Miles White and Drew Conway presenting an introduction to machine learning for hackers. John and Drew are the authors of the new O'Reilly Media book, Machine Learning for Hackers, and we are thrilled to have them here today to present this webcast for you all. I will turn the program over to John and Drew in just a moment, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open the group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for John and Drew. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for John and Drew, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure they see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you'll need to give it permission to access your account, and the Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweets so you don't have to. The hashtag today is StratacONF, all one word. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the chat room, and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close out any apps that could be interfering. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast, and we'll have an archive ready usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to John and Drew for their presentation. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, Ephraim. Thank you for introducing us. Um, and hi, everyone. We're really excited to be giving this webcast. Uh, Drew, do you have any comments? No, it's, uh, it's very exciting. Um, John and I are definitely uh, looking forward to speaking at you for a little while and then hopefully getting some Q&A going over the chat box. Great. Yeah, um, so let's get started then. So we're going to do a sort of 30 minutes or 40 minutes of discussion of sort of a very, very fast um, sort of simple overview of machine learning as sort of what is it about and how could you start thinking about it and how could you start trying to turn on your problems. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to introduce two techniques, linear regression and logistic regression. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about sort of what we're interested in doing. And so in our mind, machine learning, and this is sort of, I think, is a, an idea that really came to me from Drew and talking with him, is that machine learning sort of is one branch of two sciences, so sort of two sciences that are looking at one question, how can we learn from data? Uh, and machine learning is really interested in thinking, well, how can computers learn from data? Whereas statistics is much more interested in thinking about how humans can learn from data. And so most of what we're going to present now are sort of techniques that are sort of black boxes that you can use to allow a machine to learn something from data. Uh, and we'll talk a little about what it is you might want to learn uh, and what sort of things are easy to do using existing techniques. So to get started, we're going to talk about two types of problems. One type of problem we're going to call regression. And it's sort of easiest to see by looking at the data set that we're displaying now. So this data set is actually from um, the Million Song database. So this is a list of sort of, of, of millions of songs. Uh, and what actually happened basically was that there was a sort of reduction of sounds into just simple numbers. You can see that in this table as timbre 1 and timbre 2. Uh, and these numbers, to be honest, to me, are a little inscrutable, but they represent something about sort of the timbre profile of music. Uh, and each row describes a single song. Uh, there are many, many more columns that we're not showing here from this raw data set. If you're interested in seeing the data set, you can go to the UCI Machine Learning Repository and search um, the year machine, uh, MSD data set, and you'll find this. Uh, but what we're interested in is thinking about sort of the standard type of problem you might be facing in machine learning. And here the standard type of problem is you have, whoops, sorry about that. We have a 
year, which is on the left-hand side of the table, and you can see it's labeled as outputs. And, you know, for instance, the first one is 2001, the next one is 2001, then 2006, then 2005. And what we're trying to do is trying to predict the year that a song came from based on some information about what it sounds like. And we're only here just looking at two, which is timbre two, one and timbre two, but there are actually 90 columns in this data set that you could use to try to make this prediction. And so this idea of trying to predict some numeric output, something like 2001 or 2002, that idea is what we're going to call regression. And we're going to distinguish it from another type of problem which we'll introduce in a second called classification. Um, but before we go on, I'll ask Drew if he's got any comments or anything else he'd like to say about this. Uh, no, I mean, I think John covered it quite well. The thing you know, we'll get into as we further into the discussion is oftentimes with machine learning and people who have had their different introductions to it, is people get very caught up in, in what, what you call a certain kind of thing. So you'll hear a lot of terms thrown around like labels, um, having to do with data, and then kinds of data, numeric versus categorical, which we'll get into. And it's just important to try to keep in mind that oftentimes you can be hearing different terms and meaning the same thing. And, and, and what John and I will explain is trying to talk at least at the base level about what it, what we're trying to call it here in a, a specific way of, of saying certain things. Yeah, and I think that's a really, I think that's a really great point, which is, you know, especially because there's sort of many fields that have produced modern machine learning, like statistics, and then people in computer science, and then also in other groups like electrical engineering. There are many, many terms uh, that describe really exactly the same thing. But here, for instance, on, on this table, we've decided to call them outputs and inputs. And the idea basically is think of regression, and we'll describe a little bit more about one specific type of regression, but think of it basically as a function that you can call, and it's basically going to be a black box. And you literally just hand it inputs, which is your data set, and here would be like the table one and table two columns of your data set. And you're going to get outputs, which are predictions for the year column. And so, you know, this sort of idea of talking about inputs and outputs is what we find really helpful. Um, but you'll hear definitely other types of terms if you go sort of through the rest of the literature. Like Drew said, you'll see labels and features come up. Yeah, um, you'll see predictors. <laughs> Um, well, all sorts of different things may come through if you read enough, um, but sort of the core idea is really what we just said. You, know, sort of, you have a bunch of inputs, you pass them into the algorithm, the algorithm learns to use those inputs as a way of trying to predict outputs. Um, so I think actually we've got some questions, we'll sort of let's turn it over to that and see what's going on. Yes, we actually do have a question that came in from Dan, and Dan um, says, this looks like a classification problem. By regression, you mean there is an arrhythmic relation between inputs and outputs? Yeah, so that's actually a, a great question. So um, I think in addition to the, what Drew said earlier, which is that there are many different labels for things, so whether people talk about inputs or predictors, there's also unfortunately a slightly blurry line between regression and classification. So you could talk about this as classifying into categories of years. Um, here, what we're going to do is focus on the idea of thinking about it as a progression where it's a number, where it's like 2001, and in principle, you could get an answer like, oh, this looks like it's actually 2001.5, which we'll interpret as saying it's sort of it's in between going from 2001 and 2002. And in that sense, what we really do mean is that there is something like an arithmetic relationship between the inputs and the outputs, and we mean something like if the timbres are getting louder over time, which is something people have found by analyzing this data set, it suggests that the song came from a later year and time. Um, and so there is some sort of continuity about different, type, different years, and they're not sort of just completely discrete categories. Uh, but I think this idea actually will come a little more clear if we go focus on a question that we think is sort of is a more pure classification question, something where there's sort of no way of treating it like regression, whereas this one we're going to treat as regression. Yeah, and I think John sort of nailed it there, which is you think about the difference, and this is, and, and this is an example for sure that could be, um, could be modeled as a classification problem, but we'll think about the difference as being sort of discrete, out, discrete outputs being a classification problem and continuous outputs as being a regression problem. As John said, you could imagine that this would be 2001 and a half or 2001 and a quarter, and that is meaningful to us in this case. Yeah, I think so. I think 
that that really is sort of the really relevant thing is that sort of there is some way you could interpret numbers that are interpolated between 2001 and 2002 as meaningful, and that sort of is what separates it from classification. But maybe that will be more clear if we push forward and actually look directly at classification. Let's move on to the next slide. This slide is our sort of quintessential example of a classification problem, which is spam detection. And so here you'll see on the left-hand side the outputs are categories, and the categories are just a simple Boolean which says, is an email spam or not? And so you can see that three of them are spam, and the third row is not spam. And then the inputs here are also Booleans, and they're information about the email. And they say, did, the, did this email at some point, say in the subject line or in the body, mention Viagra? or did it mention Nigeria? And most of us know that these are things that actually are, unfortunately, related to being spam. They tend to occur more often in spam than in not. And so this is sort of a question of how do we classify an email as spam or not spam based on the contents of it? And this idea of sort of classifying this is spam, this is not spam, is what we mean by sort of predicting a category. There are two types of emails, spam and not spam. And there's sort of not some really logical mixture between them. You can talk about something that's sort of half and half spam in some sense, but you're starting to be a little metaphorical. Um, <laughs> maybe even sort of maybe even more clear, and we're going to discuss this later. Sort of another type of categorical data would be things like saying what religion did a person report when they respond to the census this year? Did they report that they were Jewish? Or did they report that they were Christian? Did they report that they were Muslim? And those are sort of categories that really don't have any sort of arithmetic relationship between each other, and they're sort of a pure classification question would say, you know, based on some inputs, do I think this person is likely to be Christian or not? Uh, and that's something that really you would not want to treat as regression, because there's sort of nothing numeric about those categories. You can force them, and a, a big part of doing machine learning is actually is forcing categories to have some sort of numeric representation, but they're really not, and sometimes really numbers whereas the years that we saw in the previous data set for regression, they really are numbers. There's, you know, first of all, they just are coming from years that are happening in sequence, but also there is something that's a really plausible and meaningful interpretation for saying this is what we think we mean when we say 2000.9. We mean something that's almost at 2001, but not quite there. Yeah, and following up on John's example from the census data, I mean, I'm sure maybe many of you um, listening and following along are thinking, well, you know, I'm, you know, I, some people could label themselves as, you know, being participating in multiple religions and are not easily categorized into discrete sets, and that is, of course, the case, and is, of course, the, the source of many difficult problems in social science related to doing machine learning on them. And just in that case, those are, those are certainly hard problems, ones for which we want to think really critically about. But for, the, for, the, for this particular um, example that we'll give today, as John said, we're going to try and spend some time forcing problems into a certain sets so that makes the actual process of doing the machine learning on them easier, and then we can interpret them as such. But there are certainly lots of gray area when you start getting into survey data and the like where people can fall into multiple categories, but in this case, we're not going to think about those problems. Yeah, and I think, I think what Drew said is really a great comment and worth keeping in mind, which is sort of machine learning techniques, they can be thought of basically as sort of black box functions that you can use, but the way that they need to be applied in the real world really requires a lot of judgment. The reality is sort of the line between regression and classification is a little blurry, and in fact, the technique we're going to introduce, logistic regression, makes them even more blurry. Um, and often the types of things you might want to predict, like religions, are also themselves categories that sort of imperfectly describe the world that we're dealing with. Um, I think a big part of sort of developing skills in machine learning really comes to just building up some intuition about saying, I'm going to accept that this is my approximation to the world we live in, and it's good enough for me, uh, and it, you know, it's going to make, miss some important parts of the world, but hopefully sort of it gets enough important parts that it's useful. Uh, you know, for instance, spam and not spam, you know. There are going to be emails that are sort of are borderline spam-ish, uh, but are actually were written by a real person and really meant to be sent to you and really meant, for instance, to receive a real response. Uh, I can think of things like recruitment emails that I sometimes get. Uh, they sort of, they seem almost like spam, but they're not really, and that really is a sign that sort of categories like this are not a perfect match for our world, but something that's sort of a, at least a, a tolerable start is really useful often to have. 
Yeah, and one interesting model uh, in machine learning may, may be the, the time in which a person giving a machine learning pre presentation ways to quote George Box, but I'll just go ahead and quote him right now because it's fitting before we move on to the next section, which is, you know, George Box is a famous statistician and he's very famously quoted as saying um, all models are wrong and some are useful. So for those of you that are really just sort of getting introduced to the topic of machine learning, sort of keep that in the back of your head at all times, particularly when you're dealing with data on human beings or data, you know, data within the social sphere because oftentimes there are really no discrete slices um, among what you're seeing and you have to build a model of the world that you think best represents an imperfect slice of what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly the right attitude and that, you know, that classic box quote is a really good one to keep in mind. Um, so let's actually quickly sort of see if there's any more questions, sort of if there's one or two more questions we will answer here, and then we'll go through sort of quickly talking about these sort of blurry lines between types of data, between categorical and numeric data. So Yasmina, do we have another question or should we move on? Sure, let's go ahead and take another question. All right, we have a question from Jamie. Jamie says, would it be fair to say that if the domain of the output is continuous, it is a regression? Yes, that is definitely the case. Um, so a regression problem traditionally is thought of as something in which it, there is a continuous output. Um, uh, and in fact, the algorithm we're going to discuss, linear regression, is actually only appropriate if the output is continuous because it will give continuous predictions back to you. So if, for instance, things in between, like, you know, 2001 plus pi uh, sort of is completely meaningless to you, well, then linear regression is actually not totally well suited to your problem. Um, one, you know, one example of that, for instance, which we're not at all going to have time to discuss, is things like uh, ordinal regression which is something that is totally not continuous, that sort of is quasi-numeric because there's some ordering like numbers, but there's no meaningful substance to calling one thing twice as big as the other one. Uh, so I think the really thinking about things as continu continuous versus non-continuous is exactly the right frame of mind for keeping regression in, in, in sort of thinking about what its distinction is from classification. Yeah, uh, nothing to add to that, that's, that's right. Okay, um, should we go ahead? I, I mean, we've already gone actually for about 20 minutes and we've got quite a few more slides, so let's uh, yeah, move on a bit. On. Yeah, so we'll, we'll sort of we'll go through faster through the next few slides because there's also sort of a lot less content in them, um, and sort of just quick stuff we want to discuss. So you know, sort of thinking through more this distinction between regression and classification, one thing we can do is just sort of split up into two types of data, numeric data and categorical data. Uh, we've already discussed a bunch about this, you know, so 2001 and 2002, we're going to treat in this case as numeric, that these are sort of truly numbers, whereas, say, spam and not spam are things that we're going to think of as categorical. And then sort of hammering home, we can actually go further, uh, further and specify numeric data and split it into two types uh, as discrete and continuous data. And in the machine learning literature, and especially the older statistics literature, there's a lot of real careful thinking about distinctions between this. For instance, we're going to discuss a thing called linear regression, which is really appropriate for doing continuous problems, whereas there is a type of thing called a Poisson regression, which is more appropriate for discrete problems. Uh, we're actually basically going to sort of just ignore some of these issues. Um, and in part, that's actually because R, the language you're using for the examples, makes it really easy to blur these lines. R is very quick to convert things that are discrete to be continuous, and it makes it just sort of very easy to sort of basically just pretend that all of your data had been recorded as continuous variables. Uh, and, you know, and getting into this a little bit more, sort of to be very clear about it, discrete data is things we mean by things that could be represented by integers. So these are exactly the sort of things that you might want to use something that's not going to give an output that's, say, like something 0.5 back. So how many robberies occurred in Philadelphia each year? Um, you certainly can give something that's not discrete back as an answer, uh, but certainly that, that suggest, sounds suspicious to many people. It's like when people say that the average family has 2.3 children. Well, clearly no family has 2.3 2 children, so what does that mean? Um, the discrete answers, though, are sometimes valuable in the sense that the additional precision is something you do want. We're, for today, going to basically just ignore that additional precision. Uh, right, and, and we've got... You know, well, I'll just, I'll just add one quick thing to that, which sort of stems from the examples that are provided here. And it, 
And one of the clearest cases where you're doing something discrete is when you're counting something. In fact, that's exactly the genesis of the Poisson model. Um, so for those of you, again, out there kind of introducing yourselves for the first time, if you find yourself asking questions around data that has to do with counts, then you're doing, you're using discrete data and therefore your model should support discrete data. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I also noticed that we just sort of quickly got a question in. I'll answer it because I'm having some trouble typing back an answer, which is asking about how we encode data that's not numeric before we can apply a regression classification. And I'll just say that we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, that's really one of the virtues of using R, is that R is very good at thinking about what are the appropriate conversion rules for turning categorical data into numeric data. But we'll, we'll expand on that in a little bit. Um, and let's, let's actually, let's just move on and keep going through types of data, since uh, these things are actually um, precisely the virtues of using R for dealing with statistical problems, is that R is really good at thinking about what is the type of model you should be applying, or what are the transformations you should be using to turn one type of data into another one. So we had some examples of discrete data. Here are some quick examples of continuous data. So these are things that really do want to be represented with floating point numbers. You know, so like what's the normal human body temperature in Fahrenheit, which is 98.6 degrees. That's something you wouldn't be wanting to use an integer for. Uh, or also even probably even more interesting would be something like what's the return on Apple stock yesterday as a percentage? Well, that percentage is certainly not something that you would want to be truncating to integers. Uh, you know, the decimal places are very relevant in thinking about the return rates for different stocks. Um, and basically, we're going to sort of just say our goal is going to be trying to trick everything in the system into being at the floating point whenever possible. That's sort of how we're going to solve our problems. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, before we do that, let's sort of talk about the other type of data that we do have to do some conversion for, and that's categorical data. So we already mentioned this in the context of classification, so let's go through it again. So there's a question of sort of, is it an email spam or is it ham? Is a person male or female? And what religion does the census respondent report? You know, so these are different types of categorical questions, things that do not have obvious numeric representations. Um, and a big part of the virtue of thinking about the traditional machine learning toolbox is thinking, well, if I gave it a bunch of categories, what are some appropriate ways to turn these things into numbers in order that I can turn over my problem into, you know, into this flat box that will solve it for me? So let's actually talk quickly about some of the things that R will do behind the scenes for you, but we won't talk much about how it's actually going to do that. Um, we'd recommend that you read up on any, rec uh, any, sort of any good book on R. There's a little discussion of an R book, but we assume a decent amount of knowledge of R before you get started. Um, I think there's an R cookbook that has probably much better references. Certainly there are other ways that you can go online. And basically what you want to look up is sort of understanding how R represents what it calls factors, and factors are its way of representing categorical data. So is there anything you want to contribute there, uh, Drew, or should I? No, I mean, that's exactly right. And, uh, and I'll say um, to those of you who are new to the R language, this is particularly important with respect to, to loading and kind of inspecting and playing with your data at the outset because, for example, R is, is a language designed for doing data analysis. So when R sees certain kinds of data, it makes assumptions. For example, when R sees string data or text data uh, as it's coming in, its thought is to automatically treat that as a category because if you're a statistician and you're loading in a survey, more often than not, the text response to something is going to be some sort of categorical label, you know, on a scale of one to five, what was your response to X, how do you label yourself on a religion, these are all categories. This is important for those of you who want to just load in free text, because if you just load in free text with the default, you'll get categories and that can be very problematic. So just keep in mind, again, that the language itself is meant, it, by default, is meant to do statistical analysis where it thinks strings equals categories, and that may not be the case for you, so you just have to keep that in mind. And again, as John said, there are lots of good references online. Our book has a very breathless introduction at the beginning, but we recommend for people who haven't done any of our programming in the past to really kind of try to learn the fundamentals of the language through either a book or an online reference. Yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm, I'm in total agreement with all of that um, and sort of they give you some sense of sort of the value that R is automatically going to convert all the string data into categorical data. But one of the things it does is all the sort of conversions that are described on this slide, it will do kind of automatically for you. Um, so the most obvious one is that it will encode 
single this single binary category, so categories that really are naturally Boolean, it will easily provide ways of encoding that as zero and one, so stain and not stain, it will set as zero and one. Um, in my experience, it's actually valuable to do that encoding for yourself manually and not just let R do it, because the zero one coding may go in the direction you don't quite want it to. So for instance, it may decide to encode spam not as ones but as zeros, uh, and you'll get sometimes surprising results back. Uh, but it is worth keeping in mind that R will do a bunch of this automatically for you. Um, if you look through enough literature, you'll also see sort of a minus one and plus one coding for things. Uh, I think it sometimes is more reasonable in thinking about things that are not Boolean to use this. But in reality, this sort of style of coding just comes from a different type of mathematical apparatus, like a support vector machine that we're not going to discuss today. That's also a really good way for doing classification. And for that, it's much more natural to encode things as male and female as minus one and plus one. And finally, the simplest thing would just be replace all the categories with just numbers that are indices into some list that says, well, if you respond to a question on the census report, we're just going to call that a one. And if you respond to two or something, we're going to call that a two, et cetera. Um, this is one of the things that, depending on what you want or what you don't want, can be a virtue or a vice of R, which is that R is very quick to do this conversion. And if you're not careful, converting a factor or some sort of string categorical data like this into numbers in R will actually give you back numbers like 1 through K. And you may be very confused by that if you're not used to seeing R doing that conversion. Um, that's something that if you know it's there, though, you can sometimes exploit and get clever things out of. Uh, we're going to just sort of ignore that detail and, and focus on simple 0, 1 data for the moment, though. So let's actually, let's get turning over to the, sort of the toolkit you might try to apply for these things. And so the toolkit we're going to discuss today are two algorithms, linear regression and logistic regression. And linear regression is one in which you're going to try to make numeric predictions. So it's going to let you do sort of a true regression problem like the original one we discussed. We want to predict 2001 or 2002. Whereas logistic regression is going to do categorical prediction. We want to say, is this spam or is this not spam? Um, the name logistic regression can be a little confusing because it sounds like it's not classification, but it is regression. And in fact, in some level, it is a regression. What it is is going to give you actually is if you have two categories, which are you know, category 0 and category 1, it's actually going to give you back its estimate of the probability that this row of data belongs in category 1. And so it actually gives you a continuous output back, but that continuous output is a prediction about what category something belongs in. And so it is actually useful for classification, even though it's on some sort of very deep level and sort of implementation level, it is actually a regression algorithm. Did you have anything you'd like to add to that, Jim? No, that's, that's it. Great. Um, so let's, let's move on and let's do a, a very, very toy problem to introduce linear regression. Uh, and you'll see this problem is particularly a toy problem, which is converting between Fahrenheit and Celsius. And the reason why it's such a toy problem is that actually there's no need to be sort of clever about the algorithm you use for doing this. Here we've given you two data points and you need to fit a line to them, because that's actually what linear regression is doing under the hood. This is going to take your inputs, which may be our, say, Celsius, and you want to convert them to Fahrenheit, or the other way around. Linear regression is just going to try to take your inputs and fit lines to them in order to make predictions in the output. Um, and here, this is really not sort of a deep problem, because you've only got two points, and basic algebra tells you that you can always fit a line perfectly to those two data points. Uh, nevertheless, I think this example is something you can write the code for very concisely, and you can quickly understand the results that you get back from R. Um, and, and also, incidentally, maybe this is just sort of a quirk of my own psychology, I find it impossible to remember these conversion rules, but I can always remember this table. So if you remember this table and you've got access to software, you can always figure out what the conversion rule is again from it. So let's actually, uh, let's go through, um, let's go through the code for this in R. Um, and maybe I'll actually turn this over quickly to Drew and let him sort of walk through what's going on here. Sure. So um, for those of you that are, have not seen uh, any R before, the first thing that we're doing here is actually setting up a data frame or R's representation of an N by N data set. Um, the useful thing about data frames in R as compared to other data, data objects in other languages is this is a, you know, a, a column by row data uh, object where the columns themselves can be of arbitrary type. Um, in our case, the columns do not have arbitrary type. They're, um, they're all integers. 
Uh, so what John is doing here is he's, laid, he's created a, um, a data frame with two columns. Uh, the first column is called Fahrenheit, and that, has, that contains a vector of two values. Um, the C uh, function in R is what's used to create um, a vector. So here he's, um, it actually C stands for concatenate. Um, he's concatenating two integers, two, 212 and 32, into a single vector, uh, and that is the Fahrenheit column. And then in the, in the next um, argument there, he's creating a Celsius column with 100 and 0 in it. Um, so that becomes DF, our data frame. Next, what we're doing is we're going to actually do the regression in a single line. So again, one of the advantages of R is that it's a functional programming language for which much of the heavy lifting for statistical computing is built right into languages all under the hood. So the LM function or linear model function is what we would use to do the regression. So um, the syntax here may be um, a bit odd to folks who haven't seen it before, but what we do here is we'll start from the we'll start from the end and work our way forward. First, we tell the function what data we're using. So we're going to use the data that we just the data frame we just created called DF, and then we're going to regress Celsius on to Fahrenheit. So that tilde there is just the syntax that we'll use to describe what the inputs and outputs are for our regression. Um, then the next function there, so now we've, sorry, we've created a new object called lm.fit, which contains the results of that regression. Um, and in later, later slides, you're going to see what that looks like. Um, so to get the outputs from that regression, we're going to use the summary function. The summary function in R um, is basically a very high-level function that's used to describe the contents of an object. So in this case, we're going to be um, outputting the summary of a linear model, but summary as a function works on many, many different kinds um, of objects, including a data frame, with one of which we've already created. Um, so we'll see the output from that, which will actually tell us um, what, what, what occurred in this regression. And then finally, um, the predict function, which is sort of doing exactly what you might fit, or I'm sorry, what you might think, is going to predict the, uh, the Fahrenheit value for um, Celsius when it equals to 40. So we pass it the, the linear model object, which contains all the information that predict needs to make the prediction, and then it's going to output the results of that for when, basically, when X equals 40, what will Y equal, or Y is the Fahrenheit value. I think that's, that's just about it, right, John? Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect summary of what we've done in this data. Um, so let's actually go look, as Drew was saying, at the output that produced by the summary of LM fit line. That's the next slide, and we'll go through it a little bit. Um, sadly, we don't have sort of time to go through it in detail, and you'll see that it's actually quite quirky. And the reason that it's quite quirky, and we'll go through an example that's not quirky, is precisely because linear regression is actually able to fit a line perfectly to those two data points. And so some of the things that it would usually put in, which are things in response to errors that it finds in its estimates, it doesn't have any errors, and so it doesn't quite know what to do. Um, so looking at this, you can see is first that it reports back the call you made to the LM function. And it tells you that you called it with formula Fahrenheit as a function of Celsius, and then you called it with data in the DF data frame. Then it tells you the residuals, which are basically the errors that you had, and it says all errors, all residuals are zero, and that's because you were able to perfectly predict the data. Um, and then sort of the more interesting thing are the coefficients. So the coefficients first is an intercept that you can see on the left-hand side, and you can see that the estimate of that is 32, and that's because when you're at zero degrees Celsius, the amount of Fahrenheit it should be 32 degrees, and that's what the intercept is telling you. And then below that, you'll see Celsius and an estimate. And this is actually the slope of that line. And basically what it says is for every one additional degree of Celsius, you should get 1.8 additional degrees of Fahrenheit. And that's actually really sort of the core of linear regression are these estimates, are these values that you fit back, like the intercept and coefficients for things like Celsius or other inputs you might put in. And getting those numbers back is sort of the crux of what you do when you do linear regression. The rest of these inputs we'll discuss on another slide when we have an example where there's actually some error in the predictions, and these other things are some measure of how certain you are of the estimates you've produced. Um, looking down at the bottom, though, I think it's interesting to see is 
the prediction you make. So you call predict on LN fit, and you hand it this new data frame in which you force Celsius to be 40, like Drew said earlier, and the prediction you get back is 104. And that is, in fact, the correct value in Fahrenheit because you've correctly fit the line to this data. Um, so is there anyone you'd like to say? Just, well, just quickly, um, you know, maybe for people who, um, who can better visualize this or understand sort of graphically what's going on, you can think back to your, you know, high school algebra days, as John was saying, where you were drawing, you were drawing points, you're drawing lines through points on a sheet of graph paper. Um, really, if you want to think about what's happening here, is we have two points on a line, we are two points on a on a plane or on a graph, piece of graph paper. We've drawn a line through them, and really, what we've tried to do is that we know two points. We know the low point and the high point, and we draw a line through it. When we predict, we sort of go out along that x-axis to where 40 is and then go up along the y-axis to where the line is actually drawn, and that's our prediction. And, it, and essentially, that is exactly what a linear model is doing with predict is it's saying, here's my best estimate of, of, a, of a straight line that fits the data you've given me. Now, every time you try to predict some value that I haven't seen before, it's going to fall along this line. Yeah, I mean, that is exactly what it does. Um, and to sort of extend that for people who sort of want to think a little visually about how linear regression is working, is that if we had given it more than just Celsius to use a prediction, which would be weird in this case because it'd be, it's possible to perfectly predict Fahrenheit from Celsius. But in another case in which you couldn't make perfect predictions, like you were trying to say the predict the return on some stock based on things like the weather, for instance. If you were trying to make those kind of predictions and you had many different things you were handing as inputs, well, what linear regression would do would be trying to fit something that's linear in every single one of those things. And so actually what it would be drawing is like a plane in two dimensions, or what people would call a hyperplane in more than two dimensions. Uh, and basically it will still be the same sort of picture that Drew was describing to you, just in more and more dimensions as you add more and more inputs that you could use as prediction. So uh, you want to move ahead, Drew? Yep, let's go. Yeah, so we'll go through another example of linear regression now, and this next regression example will be one in which there is some error. So we're going to look very, very briefly at this slide, but you'll see it's basically identical to the slide we looked at before, except that now when we create our data frame, there's a column for Fahrenheit that's got three values and a column for Celsius that has three values. And what's actually important about these three values is that the one in the middle we put in, which is 50 Celsius and 102 Fahrenheit, is actually corrupt. So you didn't put in data that actually has a real line that could ever possibly go through it, but you're going to try to find some approximation, some line that's as close to a way of predicting those values you saw as you could possibly get. And so you'll see the results on the next slide. You'll see that you still get pretty good predictions, um, but you'll see that things are a little screwed up by the fact that this one example, which is 50 degrees Celsius, is actually much hotter than 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you'll see that the predictions wind up being slightly biased down from what they ought to be. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the output when you hand linear regression that data set in which you can't actually ever fit a perfect line through the data. We'll see first that the intercept is actually much lower, and yet surprisingly, and this is actually sort of just a quirk of the data set we happen to choose, the Celsius term, the estimate for Celsius, which is the slope of that line, is actually still basically right. So what basically happens, just the line is still close to being the same line, it's just been shifted down to make up for the fact that there's that one data point, which is 50 degrees Celsius, 102 degrees Fahrenheit, that is not actually on the original correct line. Uh, and you can see that, for instance, at the bottom, the result of that is that now when we try to predict the Fahrenheit for 40 degrees Celsius, we get 97 degrees, which is several degrees lower than it should be correctly. And that's actually because precisely the intercept has been shifted down and our predictions everywhere are just sort of slightly below with the correct values because we put in a, uh, a value that corrupted this data set and made it impossible for it to be a true line to go through everything. Do you have more you'd like to say about this, Drew? Oh, that's it. Um, just beware of bad data, I suppose, although the power of linear, of linear regression is that given enough data, you know, it's approximating a good line. Yeah, and I think actually one way to sort of emphasize that is that now that we've got errors, you can see a lot more inputs, um, and you can see a lot more stuff in the summary. So you can see things like standard errors, t values, t values reported as probability. We're not going to really discuss that right now. If you'd like to see more about it, you can see it in the book. But one thing that is sort of interesting is to look down a little below that, 
and to see the multiple R squared and adjusted R squared lines. And these are measures basically of how well you're able to predict this data using the line that you're fitting. And these are saying essentially that you're getting um, the more conservative estimate that the adjusted R squared, you're getting essentially 96% of the original data you're correctly able to predict. And this could obviously vary from 100% to 0%. And so if you had things that were sort of totally useless in making predictions, you would get 0%. Or if you had something that was perfect, like before, you would get 100%, um, which actually is in, would have been the output from the previous example, except that the previous example, since there was only two points, there was nothing sort of interesting to say about that, and so the linear regression wasn't really being used. But if you had, say, put 10 points on a line, you would see that it would report back that you had an R squared of 1.0. So that gives you sort of a very quick overview of how linear regression works. And you can experiment with it in R, try giving it more inputs, and try turning it on an interesting problem. For instance, you could try turning it on to the Million Song Database we mentioned before, which you can go download if you go to the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Um, one note of caution before we turn you over and try doing that, that data set is actually very, very large um, and will take a few gigabytes of space and memory in order to represent what is this data set. It's a toy data set and easily can be represented in memory. Um, but if you've got a modern machine that they say got four gigabytes of RAM, you, sh you should be fine trying to run linear regression on that previous example. Uh, and you'll find actually interesting results out if you play with it. Um, so let's move on to logistic regression. So that's the next slide. And to review, first let's go through a little bit about how classification works. Um, so this is the data set we saw before. It's just exactly repeating what we had before, which is we've got some Boolean things, which are, are things spam or not. And then we've got some boards who are saying, did this email mention Viagra? Did it mention Nigeria? And people asked earlier, well, how do we deal with this categorical thing? Well, we're going to do what R would actually often do in the background, which is just going to convert things which are yes and no's to zeros and ones. And so we now convert that categorical data into numeric data just by replacing everything with ones and zeros. And in fact, the easiest way to do this is to actually just replace everything with continuous floating point numbers. Uh, so this will be like 1.0 and 0 0.0. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to sort of ignore that distinction right now. R is actually not very rigorous about making that distinction. Um, and just to say that this is the kind of data set we have. And now we're going to load it into R on the next slide and then go through how we fit a logistic regression. So I'm going to let Drew go through that as we turn over to the next slide. Sure. So um, we can sort of go skip the first part because we've already talked about it. But again, we're creating. Um, this data frame, and <clears throat> now that will be the data that we'll use. Again, this is just a R representation of the previous slide, which is just a simple um, matrix. Uh, then the next slide is do, or the next step, I'm sorry, is doing all the work. So just as before, we had the LM function. Now we have the GLM function. In this case, that stands for generalized linear model. Uh, the generalized linear model uh, function in R supports many different kinds of regression. In this case, we're going to be doing logistic regression. So this looks um, syntactically very similar to the previous example, but actually what's going on behind the scenes is quite different. Um, so in this case now, we're going to be adding together two different data points in our model. So now we have, if you regress, mentions of Viagra plus mentions of Nigeria against is something against the category um, is spam, that becomes the actual statistical model that we are running, but the, um, the parameter there for family is that what actually tells the function that we're going to be doing a logistic regression. So this is, the syntax itself in terms of the fact it says binomial with a, with a logit length, um, I won't, we won't talk about that specifically other than to say these are the supporting functions within the R language that tell GLM to do a logistic regression. Um, you know, for those of you who are interested in doing this, I certainly suggest going out and looking at some of the docs on that. Um, it will require some statistical knowledge. So um, for those of you who are interested in that, you should just take us at face value. This, this is the syntax for doing a logistic regression. But again, remember, in this case, the, the, the Y value or the is spam value in this statistical model is going to be expected to be 0 or 1 because that's the kind of data that a logistic regression is going to expect to see. Um, and then we'll just use, again, the summary function, which, as you'll see in this case, is taking a different kind of data object, taking the object that's returned for the GLM function, but as we'll see in the next slide, is going to produce a very similar output. And again, 
as one of the nice things about R as a language is that it has a sort of consistency across reporting for all statistical models. You'll see lots of the same kinds of things that we saw in the previous example. Yeah, and so let's actually move over and see the summary of this. And you'll see in this example that actually, again, like our original Fahrenheit example, this example is a little quirky. And the reason is that, like in the previous example, where it's possible to perfectly fit a line in order to predict Fahrenheit from Celsius, here it's actually possible to set the coefficients in this model to perfectly predict whether something is spam or not. Because in the data we showed you, any time that something mentioned Viagra, it was spam, and any time something mentioned Nigeria, it was spam. So you'll see here in the outputs that you find estimates for mention of Viagra and mention Nigeria that are very large numbers, 46.72 for both of them. And that's basically saying that if you see something that does contain Viagra, it's extremely likely that's going to be classified as, Viagra, as spam. And if you see something that contains Nigeria, very likely it's going to be classified as something that is spam. In fact, the only way that the model is able to resist that is to have an intercept, which is a fairly large negative number, pulling the baseline prediction to say this is not spam. So basically the result of this was if you gave it something that said not mentioning Viagra and not mentioning Nigeria, it will make a prediction that something is not spam. So as long as it contains one or both of those things, it will make a prediction saying that it is spam. And this is actually a sort of a quirk, again, of the data set we had, which is this data set is something you could actually perfectly predict in some sense don't need any sort of clever machine learning to do this. And so you get slightly quirky outputs like you see these Z values that are zero and P's that are one. Um, we'll go through another example where we add a little noise in the next slide and you'll see that you get sort of more meaningful outputs back for these things. But let me uh, quickly see if Drew has anything he'd like to say about this before we move on to the next slide. Well, I think that, I mean I think that's right. Given the nature of this data, you know, if you go back to if you if you remember the the table, it becomes very obvious when you look at that data that if something contains either of those um, sort of red flags for spam, we're going to say with almost exact with almost certainty that it is spam, and in every other case we say that it isn't. And that's just because of the data that we use. Of course, in practice, you have much more nuanced and more you know more deep data, which allows for um, slightly less or much less certainty in terms of your prediction. Yeah, and so let's actually go through quickly in the next slide and see an example where there's much less certainty. And so in this next slide, we've taken the original data that we had, but now if you look at it, you'll see that we've added a new entry, and this is the one that's the furthest to the right in each of these three vectors. So it's an, a thing that is going to be is spam on the fifth entry is zero. So this is something that's not spam, but it's going to be the case that mentions Viagra for this fifth entry is one, and mentions Nigeria for this fifth entry is one. And so this is an email that, for whatever reason, happens to say Viagra and Nigeria in it, but isn't spam. And you, mean, you can imagine, for instance, this is a friend of yours writing to you an email about how he's trying to build a spam filter and how he finds his Viagra and Nigeria predictors. But his email is, in fact, not spam, even though he contains those two words. Uh, and so this data set would be a little harder to classify because it's something that sort of you can't fit a very simple rule. You need something that's somehow statistical, that somehow has to deal with in uncertainty and imperfect predictions in the world. But nevertheless, you can still run, just like before, a logistic regression. And as Drew mentioned, this syntax is how you do it. You use the GLM function, then you have to say family equals binomial link logit, which is just the syntax R asks you to use in order to get a logistic regression. But the result of this you'll see, and I'll let Drew go through the result a little bit, is a model that actually has to cope with uncertainty and has to make predictions in the face of data that is not perfectly informative. Right, so again, we're gonna see a very um, similar output here, but we will notice as compared to uh, the previous slide that our, uh, our intercept has moved up quite a bit. Um, and now the, um, the predictions have changed quite a bit. So I'll, um, if you look at the, um, the predicted probabilities there in the, in the fourth column, the uh, PR for the Z value, they said they used to be all one. And now we have quite a bit more uh, uncertainty. And then again, also looking at the standard errors, we have quite a bit more uncertainty. So, you know, this is a numerically, a numerical representation of the kind of uncertainty that we've all experienced with um, spam detection, which is nothing's perfect. Um, and, and most spam detectors are, are looking for word counts, and this is a very stylized toy example of looking at word counts 
Um, we see that oftentimes people will add words to things that are red flags and models will pick them up and it's because of this inherent uncertainty in that that we end up having important emails ushered into our spam folder. Um, so this is a really good example, you know, if you look, if you, if it, when you get a chance to look back at the slides, um, you'll see that there are these big numeric changes and it's just as a result of one data point. And it is important to note that these sort of things can have big drastic changes on, the, on what the model will predict. I'd like to, you know, sort of hammer how that home a little bit, which I think Drew is really saying something that's really relevant, which is sort of small changes, especially in a very small data set like this, which has only got a few examples in it. Small changes can have pretty substantial effects on the actual kind of predictions you're going to make and the way the model you're going to fit is going to actually look. And so I'd really encourage you, and we're going to distribute the code for this webcast in just a little bit, if it's not already been distributed in the group chat, um, and there's a link for all the code on GitHub, I really encourage you to go home and play with this. You know, so first make sure you have R installed, but if you do have R installed, just you know, edit these data sets a little bit and see what happens if you create a few entries that are not spam but mention Viagra, mention Viagra and so on and so on, and just see how the results change. Uh, and we'd also, we haven't done it here in these slides, but I'd encourage you also to look at the types of predictions that this logistics fit makes for data. You'll have to do something like the predictions we did for the linear example, but instead now do it for logistic. And you'll see, um, you'll see at first slightly quirky predictions, and that's because the way logistic regression works, it's actually going to give you continuous numeric outputs as predictions, um, but you can actually threshold those predictions as whether they're positive or negative, and those positive or negative threshold values will tell you whether it thinks something is or is not spam. Um, and if you read up a little bit more um, on this topic or if you look in the references in our book, you'll find out more details about how the regression actually converts those numbers into predictions and specifically how it produces probabilities of being spam or not spam. Um, but you, know, you should certainly, I, we would encourage you to just get some feel for it. So just try it out and see what happens. Um, and even, for instance, go grab a real spam data set, go turn it into word counts, so basically to say, does it contain this word or does it not contain this word for every email, get the labels of whether it is or isn't spam, and then try to fit logistic regression. Um, that actually yeah, is going to be the end. Go ahead, John. That was going to be the end of our slides. Um, so now we're going to just switch over and start to have a Q&A session with everyone. But I'll first let Drew uh, make some comments. Yeah, the only, the final parting note I wanted to make, um, and this is for all things uh, machine learning, um, the best way to learn any of this stuff is to really have uh, a question in mind um, and then approach the method as a means of solving that question. So if you do have a question regarding classifying text documents, um, you know, spam isn't really that exciting, but there may be something in, that you're working on that requires classification of text documents, that's the perfect way to introduce yourself to these methods and to a language like R because it's well suited for that. So just as a general um, piece of advice for approaching this stuff, definitely have a question in mind when you're doing it because it will, it will make a lot more, interpreting the results for um, you know, an example for which you understand the context will be much easier than just some random bit of text that you may have downloaded online and now you have to go back and learn what it actually says before you can sit there and interpret the result. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Drew. I think that's a big part of the reason we decided to write the book, Machine Learning for Hackers, is to, to really encourage people to think of these methods as something that you need to build familiarity with by actually using in practice. You actually need to just try them out on things that you care about, questions you want to answer, until you get some intuition about how they work. And you know, it will take you a long, long time to develop an intuition as rich as, as it could be developed. And people have been studying linear logistic regression for now multiple hundreds of years for linear regression and logistic regression for about 100 years. So there's a huge amount known, and you can really, really learn a lot as you explore more and more about it. Do you want to cool, so go with a question? No. Yeah, there's a couple. I think there's a couple of questions in the queue, so you can go. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yes, we have several questions coming in, as you can imagine, and we'll just um, start in the order they came in. We have a question from Raj Kumar. Which one is better, R or Mahout, to get started in machine learning? Well, you're asking two very biased people. Um, I mean, I, I think it depends. Uh, well, I'll just say, first off, 
I don't have a ton, a ton of experience in Mahout, so I'm maybe not the best person to answer this. Um, I'll give you the reasons why I think R is a good place to start for machine learning. First, um, as we sort of alluded to in the examples we'll draw out, the, fun the functional programming that is, because R is a functional programming language and because of the functional programming language designed to do statistical programming, much of what you will need to do for machine learning is already built right into the language. So if you can get over the hump of the syntax, which, which admittedly is quite odd and can be hard to understand, especially if you're coming from a programming background where a lot of what is done seems very odd, um, it's really great because you, you can really focus on understanding why something works or how it works um, as you're learning the methods of machine learning and not have to think so much about how do I build this thing because it's already built for me. Now I can just look at summary outputs and try to interpret and understand what's going on there. Yeah, and I think I'd like to add into that, which is Mahout as it current stands is really is a tool set for doing machine learning if you already know what you want to be doing. Um, I think R is a language that's really appropriate if what you want to do is learn or explore. Um, Mahout is really appropriate if what you want to do is use this black box function to do a specific task. Um, and if that task, for instance, is build a scalable spam classifier, you definitely want to use Mahout. You do not want to use R. R is not really appropriate for running in production. Um, and I would really strongly encourage you not to try to use it in production. Um, but I think if you want to try learning how these algorithms work, uh, R is really sort of the perfect playground for figuring these things out. Great, thank you. Um, another question here from Rojerito who asks, how do you usually encode data that is not numerical for applying a regression or classification? Uh, so I would say usually, um, usually I would just actually, if you're, if you're able to use R, I would entrust R's default mechanism for doing this. And so what R is actually going to do is it's going to turn out to, um, to turn categorical data, assume that your category has a K level, so levels 1 through K. What it's actually going to do is it's going to create uh, K different vectors for that, and those K different vectors are going to be Booleans that say, yes or no, is this thing in category 1 or is it non category 1? Yes or no, is this thing in category 2 or is it non category 2? Da 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 da. Um, Actually, whether it contains a full K or it may sometimes contain K minus one columns depends a little bit on the algorithm you're going to use. I'd, I'd rather not sort of get into the details of that. But this idea of basically saying replace some large categorical problem with K different Boolean questions, which is are you in this category or are you not in this category for each of the K different categories is the most standard way of trying to replace categorical data and turn it into some type of usable numeric data. Um, yeah, and sort of specific, specifically, sorry, Doug. Oh, I was just going to ask if you had some other comment about that. Yeah, no, I was just for those of you who may be um, you know, sitting at your at your computer with the R console open, um, the factor function, um, or as dot factor, is what R uses to do the conversion. So if you look at the docs on that, it gets very specific about its methods for doing stuff, and in and of itself is a very useful uh, read on how one might think about converting this stuff. And all these docs are also available over the web. So if you just Google R factor or R as doc factor, I'm sure it will be one of the first hits. Thank you. I and mean, questions just keep coming in. Thank you, folks. We'll take as many as we have time for. We have a question here that asks, let's see if I can get it up here. Um, how does Pandora use machine learning to classify the kinds of music its users would like? <laughs> I think we are, to be honest, not super well qualified to answer that. <laughs> don't work for Pandora. Um, last I heard, they actually don't use machine learning, and they pay right. human beings to do it. Um, but that's that's. That is, that is corporate knowledge that I don't. I certainly don't have access to, and I'm going to guess that Drew doesn't have access to. No, and your. I mean, with the Pandora example specifically, I think John's exactly right. Their music genome project is pretty, is almost exclusively. I should. I don't really know, but I think it's it's very, there's a huge amount of human work that goes into writing those ontologies for music. Um, I think the better example may be the last data FM example, which uses. Um, uh, unsupervised machine learning techniques, none of which we talked about today, and we obviously don't have time in the next 30 seconds to talk about them, uh, to create, um, to add labels to, to songs and music to give recommendations for music that you might like based on what you've um, liked in the past. And if you Google last.fm machine learning, 
Um, I think there's been some papers written on it because they um, uploaded a bunch of their data a while back. Thank you. And another question here from Sumit, and actually a lot of people had this question. What is your opinion about R-Hadoop, the R and Hadoop combination? So, I, I mean, think I, I, I agree with yeah, I mean, I think that it's fantastic. I mean, one of the um, biggest complaints and something that we touched on very slightly today is that R as a language is never really designed to handle um, quote unquote big data simply because it wants to load everything into memory. So any in any way that you can offload some of that to um, a distributed disk is tremendous and the R Hadoop project is one of a few sort of distributed or parallel R projects that are out there. Um, there's lots and lots of work happening in the R community to try to improve on, uh, in some sense, the stigma of it not being able to handle big data, um, particularly in a world where big data is like the thing that you need to be doing. Uh, so it's great. Uh, I think that all of these projects are, are tremendous and as sort of an aside that's not necessarily related to the question is, again, one of the advantages of working in R is the huge user community and the huge amount of contributed um, software and packages that are added to the language. And the R Hadoop is just one of many examples where people saw a problem in the language and decided to try to fill it and fix it. I think I'll just go with Drew. I basically am in agreement with that. I have very little experience with R Hadoop, so I have no sort of useful comments above and beyond. For yeah, this. the problem for John and I is, and probably for me, it's not really a problem, but oftentimes um, we don't really use the big data stuff where our problems are slightly smaller. Yeah, or, or I mean, I've, I've recently been doing some bigger scale things, um, uh, and I find that sort of those things are not often parallelizable, so sort of uh, many sort of state-of-the-art machine learning techniques are things that have not yet been figured out how to make parallelizable. Um, in that case, I find the sort of trying to patch R is not so useful and you need to switch to a faster language. Um, I'm, you know, lately I've been some really enamored of Julia for that. Um, but basically, it's, it, it comes to the problem that when I have to deal with bigger data sets, the bigger data sets I have are not ones that are really well suited for working on Hadoop for anyway. Great. And there's a couple more questions here, folks. Um, we have a question from Kendra, and Kendra would like to know, what software could we incorporate into a mobile app to classify users over time based on their usage of the app? For example, heavy users get more notifications, light users get more personalized content, et cetera. Uh, I so think to be honest, yeah. so, well, I, I think to be honest, if you, you, know, if you want to do something like that, there are sort of a variety, there's a continuum of approaches of sophistication. Um, I think the simplest one is to just try to figure out if you if you have these categories and you know what they are, is to fit some sort of categorical prediction model, um, something like logistic regression or something that's slightly stronger to handle multiple categories. Figure out some mechanism for turning in usage data into predictions of categories, and then just hard code that translation system. And that translation system will be basically something that just does a bunch of multiplications and additions. Because um, at the end of the day, that's what logistic regression is doing. Um, and that will be your software. And the actual mobile app will be something that's just going to use the default fitted model um, and implement it in, in, on each of the mobile devices. Um, I think the opposite end of the spectrum is uh, hire someone whose job it is to think about this and build an increasingly sophisticated tool that reacts dynamically to things and changes every day in response to new users. Uh, I think it really depends on, on the details of what it is you hope to get back out of this and, and how much you want to be investing in it. But I'm sure Drew has other really thoughtful comments about this. So. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that that's, that's right. You know, uh, specifically, if there's software that can be running on the mobile app, I mean, most of the companies that I've spoken to are not, they're not running predictions on the device. So they're just recording data and whether, you know, depending on the granularity with which they want to make predictions, they're running their model over new data at some interval, um, whatever makes sense for them. And then they're just caching the prediction so that when a user interacts with the device, it's pinging back to, you know, whatever the server is that has the model on it and asking for a prediction on the, whatever the latest bake of that model is. Uh, I don't think that they're um, really running software on the mobile device is not really something that Don, as, as John described, 
depending on your um, your temperament and your your desire to get sophisticated, there's a, a huge spectrum of sophistication that you can go through in terms of what that model looks like back on the server. But the way that it's typically done is collect data, model it, create a set of predictions, and then keep doing that as more data comes in. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see here. Folks, we do have time for just a couple more questions. A question from Dan. Uh, Dan would like to know, is logistic regression useful for the design of recommender systems? Um, I think it really depends on what it is you're trying to do as a recommendation. So I think so Drew mentioned this, you know, like uh, LastFM style data set, um, which actually if you're interested in finding is comes from a previous academic project called Audio Scrabbler. And so if you Google Audio Scrabbler, you can find this data set that eventually became LastFM. Uh, and the issue basically is how could I recommend similar artists to the artists that you currently have? Um, you could use logistic regression for doing that. Uh, in practice, people do something that's much, much, much simpler, um, which is basically they take every artist and then they build this matrix which has rows, so it's a database, and the rows are artists, and the columns are all the users, and did they or did they not listen to this thing, or maybe how many times did they listen to it, it sort of depends on what you want to do. And basically what they do is just take some sort of what's called a cosine similarity between every single artist to figure out which artists are most similar to other artists. Um, and you can find tons of references about calculating cosine similarity, uh, and this sort of this very, very naive, very simple recommendation system approach is really is just give a person as recommendations the things that are most similar to the artists you've already seen that they listen to. Um, there's way more that could be done than that, but that sort of is the first order approximation to what you want to do when you want to build some naive recommendation system. Um, but maybe, maybe Drew would like to chime in with sort of alternatives because there certainly are others. No, I mean, the, this is, a, again, sort of a general answer to, you know, this question, which is, you know, whenever you're building a model, you want to make sure that the model you're building is appropriate to the data inputs, is what John was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. So logistic regression itself is appropriate if the output is a zero or a one. So if, in that case, you're trying to build a recommendation system that recommends something, recommends to someone, in either or decision, then yes, I think it would be appropriate. But again, there are lots and lots of ways of getting about building recommendation systems for which that's not really appropriate. Um, and there's lots and lots of different um, models for that, um, sort of out of the scope of this talk. Thank you. And one question here from Michael. Michael would like to know, what approaches would you suggest for clustering results into fuzzy or radial categories that aren't predetermined? Could you actually repeat part of that? So fuzzy or radial, was it? Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael, if we're seeing it right, what approaches would you suggest for clustering results into fuzzy or radial categories that aren't predetermined? Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a quick uh, response to that. I'm not sure if I fully understand what was meant by radial. Um, I think the, the quick response I'll say basically is, any clustering algorithm, any algorithm that's going to produce clusters is going to get things that are, are not well determined. It may pretend that they're not, it may pretend as if they're well determined, but the reality is it's going to learn some categories, some data, um, and they're, they're not really sort of clean. It's not going to be the case that sort of unambiguously this data point belongs in this category or this data point belongs in that category. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to try to find if you tell it, you know, I want to find K categories, it's going to try to find K reasonable categories. Um, and the standard way of doing that is actually it's, it's called K-means. Um, it's a very old algorithm. You can find tons and tons of implementations of it online and tons of examples of it. Um, and it's going to find you K categories, and they're going to be, in some sense, fuzzy. Um, I feel like there's probably more subtlety to the use of the word radial that I'm not getting. Um, but I think that's a, a good starting point. Maybe Drew has sort of other information. No, I mean, the well, specifically on radial, I mean, K-means uses the, the idea of a centroid as part of its initial inception. So, you know, um, to the person who asked the question, if you're not familiar with K-means, I would certainly, you know, spend some time on, on the Wikipedia page checking it out because, it, as, as John mentioned, this is, the, this is sort of the first thing that you learn when you, when you get into thinking about 
clustering data is the k-means method, and then there's, then there's lots and lots more ways you can think about clustering data after that. Um, I, I typically like to compare k-means to uh, some kind of hierarchical clustering uh, because I like, you know, in, in k-means you provide the k-value, so you say I want 10 categories, um, and then you get that, whereas hierarchical clustering, you know, you have this hierarchy where you can sort of step through different um, different levels of the hierarchy to see how things cluster in there. Nice comparison when you're thinking about the methods, but, you know, k-means would be the place to begin. Great, and our yeah. final question is from Marnie. Marnie would like to know, is there an online community where experts can help you with machine learning? Yes, what is, John, what's this, the uh, Stack Exchange for Machine Learning? Remember the so name of it all. Yeah, so there's um, cross, va cross validated, cross -validation, which is the yeah. you know, stack overflow for machine learning. Um, yeah, I think probably Drew's right. I think that's probably the best resource for people who are sort of not experts to ask people who are experts. Um, if, you, if you've got a little more background, there's also a website called Meta Optimize, which is really useful, um, but it seems to tend to have slightly more expert users than cross-validated. Um, not to say cross-validated, to be honest, also has extraordinarily expert users as well. Um, but probably, I think Drew is probably right, cross-validated is probably the best start for trying to find an expert who would be willing to help. Um, yeah, and it's pretty, I mean, I'm sure most people are familiar with the sort of Stack Exchange format um, or Stack Overflow format, but, you know, so for clustering, as an example, that we just answered a question on it, if you were to go to cross-validated and just search the clustering tag, you would quickly learn a lot about what happens in clustering because you just, by virtue of seeing the questions, learn a lot about um, the method. So that's a great place um, to learn about some of this stuff in a community of people who are experts. Gentlemen, that was an extremely fantastic webcast you presented for us all today. We thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending the webcast today and hope you've benefited from it. We'd like to let you all know that John and Drew's book, Machine Learning, is the O'Reilly deal of the day. And what that means for you is you can get it today at a great price as a thank you for attending the webcast. Please visit O'Reilly.com, look on the right-hand side, you can't miss it, it's right there. And we've also pushed out to you folks a special code in your group chat. So if you haven't opened that group chat, please do, there's a special code in there to save you a little bit of money on the book. Again, we thank you, John, we thank you, Drew. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, thank Thanks you. Bye-bye.